It's so good to gather as a body of Christ to worship our amazing God who calls us together as a community of faith, embracing all peoples and all nations, all voices, all hearts that are dedicated to the proclamation of his word. So welcome this morning, and we especially welcome two of our guests, our soloists, which we have already heard, and is a returning guest. Uh, Cecilia Tucker Myers, it is so good to have you in the house, Cecilia. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your gifts. And a gentleman that I have never had the opportunity to hear preach, but certainly have enjoyed our conversation, and that's Dr. Bethel, um, who I know is a longtime pastor over at Bethel. I thought for years it was named after you. I really did. <laughs> Uh, until somebody corrected me, but it should have been, I think, for your amazing ministry there. So thank you so much for coming today and offering God's word to us. But now let us turn our hearts to the worship of our God. Good morning. Happy are those who walk in the way of the Lord. For they will find peace in the souls and joy in the service.
You may be seated. And watching my grandchildren a few weeks ago, they get to pick out stories to read. And I let them get away with the idea that they can read as many books as they want. Usually they're limited to two. But as my grandson, who's now six, he says, when he realizes that I'm going to read stories, he says, to the God books, and runs off. He gets all the God books that they have. The joy in that and the running to hear God's story just truly lifted my heart and soul. When we get together and worship, I like to think of us like my grandson. It's like to the gospel that we may run and hear his good news once more. This is the God to whom we open our hearts in prayer and rejoicing in hope and salvation. Would you pray with me? Our prayer of confession it is in the bulletin. Holy God, we confess that we often bow down before other gods and have turned our hearts away from you. Forgive us, holy God, and mend what is broken, that we may be one with you. Amen. Let us offer our silent prayers of confession. Amen. I think one of God's blessings is that he does not let us see ourselves as we truly are in all its fullness. Because I think if he did, I think we would truly be crushed when we realize how far we and our world has fallen short of all that God would want for us, of all that he calls us to be and the disciples that he calls us to be. I think God's gift is that even in the midst of all of that, he reaches out through the darkness, through the pain, through the fear, through the brokenness, and offers a way of hope and salvation and grace and mercy, which restores our souls. The power of the gospel to transform our lives is a powerful force as we allow it to transform ourselves more and more until we can be revealed in him. Hear the good news of the gospel and know its truth, not only here, but especially here. Because of the power and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven people. May the peace of Christ be with you all. A mark of that grace and our receipt of that grace is how we extend that peace one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us do so with joy and thanksgiving. is loving God. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit as we hear your word this day. Fill us with your truth that we may walk in the ways of God 
and to the glory of your reign. Amen. Our Old Testament is Numbers 11, verses 16 through 17. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. I will come down and talk with you there and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them and they shall bear the burden of the peoples along with you so that you will not bear it all by yourself. Isaiah 32, 15 through 17. Until a spirit from on high is poured out on us and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful fields is deemed a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness abide in the fruitful field and the effect of righteousness will be peace and the results of righteousness, quietness and trust forever.
Before I read 2 Corinthians, I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Santulli and the beautiful singing of Ms. Myers and Ms. Harvey. Thank you for the assistance. I'm happy to see that in the second Corinthians, third chapter, first sentence of the 17th verse, the word freedom is used. In the King James Version, it's liberty. But freedom is a translation from the Aramaic that Jesus actually spoke. The apostle says this. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from the one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. I'm so happy to see a few friends, old faces, and happy to meet the, the pastor and, and uh, I recognize a few members of the choir <laughs> from years back in my days in Plainfield. I now live in uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and uh, it's, it's a nice challenge uh, over here. I'm glad I made it this morning. I'd like to speak to you today on the spirit beneath us. According to a professor, Bart Ehrman, who was chair of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, there are a number of lost scriptures to the Bible, not included in the Old or New Testament. For example, the gospel according to the Hebrews and the gospel according to the Egyptians. You know, the gospel according to the Egyptians was written when Jesus was taken by Joseph and Mary to Egypt, running away from Herod and, um, and his son, who were determined to destroy them. Also, the Acts of John in New Testament and the Acts of Paul. Whether this discovery is accurately documented, it points out one truth. As we celebrate the contributions of the African American to the American historical experiences, there are still some underlying questions to be yet brought to the recognition that we need to give clearer insight to and the picture of human progress. It is related to this concept of lost pages that we need to meet up to in terms of challenge. The spirit left behind in the Old Testament is called ruach in Hebrew, means soul. And in the New Testament is pneuma from the Greek, meaning spirit in reference to the Holy Spirit. This was long left behind us by those groups who were in America long before Columbus arrived. They are buried beneath us even today. The spirit cries out. And we need to respond to the humane reference to that spirit among the native groups that we unfortunately call Indians. You know, Columbus thought he landed in India and the people did not refer to themselves as that. It's interesting how we refer to people around the world and they don't refer to themselves like that. When I was in Africa, for example, and I went to Nigeria, and I use the word African, and I was reminded, no, I'm not African, I'm Yoruba. 
oh, I'm not African, I'm Igbo. And so the people who lived here before Columbus came referred to themselves by their group, who they were. And it's interesting also that Columbus came to Christianize these people. And you know, it's interesting with every group of people who lived on this land, they called God the Great Spirit. They had different names for it, but it was the same God. It's interesting that the God that we worship is called many things around the world and even in other faiths, but it is still the God that we worship. In recognition of the African-American experience, Africans were on the American soil before Columbus came. My dear friend and colleague who passed away, and I had the privilege of speaking his eulogy at the Riverside Church in New York, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, anthropologist, discovered with a team of researchers evidence of Africans being here before Columbus came. They came from Nigeria and Ghana and Gambia. It's interesting the connection. So I'm related to a Gambian. <laughs> uh, I came from a slave woman who was a Mandinka from Gambia and spoke Mandinka. So they were here on this soil. They were here amongst us. And even where we sit, the Native American that we call Indians, they're buried here. They're underneath us. They represent a spirit. They were, they were in this area of America, the Delaware and the Susquehanna groups. I won't call them Indians or tribes. That's a word that we is offensive to the people who identify themselves. They're not tribes. They're people and groups and nations. If you look at the map of the people who were native, they had names identified and residences identified around the country. They generated a spirit that calls to us today. Their spirit lies beneath us and gives us a sense of what we should be doing, not only in our expression, but in our deeds. The spirit beneath us lives. In the book of Numbers, the 11th chapter, 16th to the 17th verses, the spirit of God is carried through the people, those living and those who have passed away. Ruha. They call upon us today. When I was in Israel, I told the guide who took us around, it was a Saturday on the Sabbath. And I said, why are you out working today? It is your Sabbath. Oh, she said, 80% of the Jewish people don't go to synagogue. That is the problem. Why are they not worshiping? Why are they not following Ruach, the spirit of God? In the book of Isaiah, the 32nd chapter, the 15th to the 17th verses, the prophet Isaiah confronted Judah and Israel to renew relationship with God through spirit, ruach. To gain God's spirit, righteousness would prevail and living in the harmony with God's will would prevail. God is love, agape. And all his commandments are righteousness. People who love God with all their heart and their neighbor with all their minds as themselves are at peace with God and with the world about them. It is a challenge before us. The soul that calls out to us, Ruach, is a spirit that yet yields itself to our ears and our hearts. It comes from the natives, it comes from the African, it comes from those who worship our Lord yet past. It comes through the thinking of Moses. It comes through the thinking the apostle Paul. The spirit beneath us yet calls out. Lasting peace could prevail only where there is a solid foundation of righteousness. 
Without justice, there can be no peace. People who cling to sin will never find peace. In 2 Corinthians, as the Apostle Paul suggested in the third chapter, 17 to the 18th verses, the Lord is that spirit, Numa. Numa is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the New Testament. It comes through the interpretation of Greek. The Apostle Paul speaks to the Trinity that lives with us. It's interesting that we, in our theological perspective in the Presbyterian Church, emphasize the Trinity, but it has purpose and meaning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The fact that our Lord came to us in the Spirit from God is a fulfillment of the nature of God with us. The Spirit was a transmittal force of one person to another. And dwelling of the Spirit controlled the will and affected one's desire to follow the path of righteousness and do good for humanity. The path of righteousness always comes with the notion of faith, but we can have no faith unless we have this spirit, Numa, of God living and moving in us. We can have no sense of insight of God with us unless we hear the calling out of the people who have passed on, who lie beneath us, and who acknowledge this sense of spirit that should live and move in our hearts as we strive towards peace, as we strive towards justice, as we try strive towards a, a sense of purpose. When I went to the Philadelphia Presbytery, I had a very interesting experience. I became very upset at the killings in the streets of Philadelphia by young African-American men. And some of us are working on that. It is a sad thing, the frustration that's there and the poverty that is there in that large city. But I drafted a, a, a letter and I had people sign it. It's interesting, I took it to the press period, Philadelphia, 52 people signed it, they were all women. I don't know what happened to the men. But I suggested strongly that we deal with the second amendment to the constitution. In a civilized society, no citizen should have the right to bear arms. Police, yes. Soldiers, yes. But why should citizens bear arms? And so we still have that as a challenge. The spirit within us then rises up from those who call out from the grave, tells us that we must adhere to the spirit of God in the sense of Trinity that we might move forward to have progress where we are and move forward with a sense of peace and understanding. If there's no justice, there's no peace. The spirit came to us in the deeds of many voices. And I look back at the African-American experience when I think about the spirit beneath us. I look at Harriet Tubman who led slaves to freedom through the Underground Railroad as a conductor, who inspired those who she carried over from slavery to freedom. Around 1850, she did her deeds. She listened to the voice of the spirit. She was inspired by religious views. I look at the, the deeds of Gabriel Prosser, who in 1800 planned the first major slave rebellion, influenced by biblical insight, and was led by the sense of the spirit that those that he could set free would be free indeed. I look at the deeds and the work of Mary McCloy Bethune, who founded in 1904 the Daytona Normal and Industrial Institute she put down $1.50 out of $5 she had in one hand and the Bible in the other and purchased a little piece of land in Daytona Beach, Florida, which is now Bethune-Cookman University. It started as Bethune-Cookman College, a college found on prayer, a, dollar, a college found on $1.50. This has to do with spirit. What else is there? the spirit of God that lives and moves, and she had it. It was a spirit that came beneath us 
and rose up to her heart and it gave her vision and hope as she led young people to a new destiny of education and development and insight. I look at the deeds of Martin Luther King Jr. who was inspired in his childhood by his Baptist minister father. He was very bright. He skipped two grades and when he went into Morehouse College, he was age 15. He was inspired by the spirit that he heard from the pulpit of his father. He was inspired by the idea that there could be hope in the world. And as he went on to close a theological seminary and then Boston University for his, his PhD, he learned the ethics and the vision of Mahatma Gandhi. And he developed this whole concept of love that came through agape, which we should worship by. You know, we have many forms of love and we need to revisit those forms of love because Martin Luther King emphasized the whole concept of agape. The Greek word means love giving without expecting anything in return. But most of us live by eros and philia. We live by the love of feeling. We live by the love of relationship. But we in the church have a responsibility. If we gain the sense of the spirit, to live by agape, giving love without expecting anything in return. The deeds of these three people are the deeds that we can have in vision and the hope for our own lives, that we must move forward and have a sense of the spirit beneath us, rising up from those who have passed on, those who have lost land, those who were chained in, as slaves, those who always sought for freedom. And yet we live in such a challenging world. When I was a student at Central High School in Philadelphia, I was on the swim team. The only two African-Americans on the swim team was my cousin, Lowell Bethel and myself. And I wondered why, of course, we were only 0.02% black. Bill Cosby was there with us. I'm sorry what has happened to him, but he was a little ahead of me. But we had to, it was a magnet school. We had to take a special exam and score a special IQ to get into school. But I played football. I was an all-conference tackle. And you have to forgive me at my present age, my stumbling around, I have four pins in my back uh, from football and heavyweight wrestling. Uh, so it's not just age, I'm just faltering. But I had a hard time making the swim team, but I beat out 40 guys. He only took 30 on the team, 70 tried out. There was a, a Richard Bethel on the team, and I was Leonard Bethel. But he stood 6'2", and I stood 6'2". He was blonde hair, blue eye, and you see my color. We got in the shower after practice one day. And how long do you have to stay in the shower after you come out of a pool? We were in there an hour. He was curious about me. I was curious about him. We never spoke to one another on the same team together until all the team members left the shower. And he and I were left. And he looked at me and said, are you Bethel? I said, yes. I said, you're Bethel? He says, yes. I said, uh, he said, who was Henry Bethel? I said, it's my father. I said, who is Captain Richard Bethel? He said, that's my father. I said, where's your father from? He said, Nassau, Bahamas. I said, my dad is also. And then I said, have you ever heard of a Duncan Bethel? He said, yeah, that's my great grandfather. I said, yeah, this is mine too. Duncan Bethel took a woman from the Gambia, West Africa. He was a slaver. He transmitted slaves. Uh, in the triangular slave trade from uh, West Africa and uh, to uh, the Caribbean and America. When I said that, being blonde and blue-eyed, he turned red as an apple and he turned away from me. And of course, you know, my West Indian father stood six foot six. And of course, uh, Duncan Bethel was six eight. That's why we got our height like that. But the souls of the spirit of those of the past cried in me and said, why, well, how did we get here? 
I am a descendant of slaves and here is a descendant of a slave master. There has to be a sense of us moving forward in freedom and justice. Of course, he was practiced his Jewish faith being Jewish. And, you know, and I practice the Christian faith. The spirit calls on us today, you and I, to meet up to the reality of the life in which we live. And here in this church, we have to make a difference. We have to bring the spirit that is beneath us to the forefront and acknowledge what has happened in history and understand history. I feel so sorry that the governor of Florida is trying to rid African-American history. I helped to create Africana at Rutgers University. I was one of the organizers of that. And out of Africana studies came women's studies, Hebraic studies, Latino studies, East Asian studies. We have to learn about other people and their cultures and their languages. And in my department, we introduced Swahili and Yoruba and Zulu. I had, when I chaired the discipline, I had higher scholars to teach that. Let us live in the world of reality. Let us listen to the spirit beneath us and acknowledge so our next generation of young people can have their minds broadened. This world is not just made of education in French, German, and Latin. It's also Zulu and Swahili and Arabic. And we need to have this generation of young people, when they learn these things, they will tolerate other people. They will tolerate the world in which we live. They will deal, do away with the ignorance of racism and narrow-mindedness. Listen to the spirit beneath us and come lift it up before us so that you and I can be the instruments of hope. If there's no justice, there's no peace. If there's no understanding, there is ignorance. If there's no vision, there is no hope. If there is no insight that our Lord Jesus Christ brought to us, then there is no insight at all for hope of regeneration and development. We have moved forward technologically. It's interesting how you know the computer and the iPhone and all of these instruments are so advanced. And we're looking at the advancement in military instruments and all the things scientific with the computers and televisions and all the things that we have before us. But where we have failed is human development, humanity, social ability. We fail there. We have not advanced in those areas as well as we advance technologically. And that becomes a new challenge for the new age. Let us find ways, both educationally and socially, to develop an age of hope for a generation that is tolerant and understanding and understandable. As we gather together today, my friends, the spirit beneath us must rise again to influence the American society to become anti-gun, anti-violence, anti and become racially and justifiable and opportunity for all and clear sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. So rise up spirit and take hold of the spirit that was given to us through our Lord and help us march on and forward. Amen and Ashe.
Let us receive affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge and the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Um, before I invite you all to uh, participate in the ministry of offering, I just wanted to say three really quick things. One, the Reverend Dr. Bethel was my professor at Rutgers University back in 1987 as he chaired the Africana Studies Department, one of the first departments that allowed students of color to find a space that we could call home and be able to connect with our identity and not be ashamed. So with that, I will always be grateful for the work of Dr. Re Reverend Dr. Bethel for what he has poured into many African-American students at Rutgers University. And he was also the first uh, Presbyterian of color that I, a preacher that I had ever heard preach. So um, there is a spirit of connection with Dr. Bethel. Second, you will see some people wearing these. No, we did not call each other up and, and coordinate our, our wardrobes. These are called kente cloths and they are connected to what we refer to as the motherland. They have deep meaning. They allow us to reconnect with the motherland. And then third, I just wanna say that Rosa Parks sat at the front of the bus so that we could sit anywhere we wanted. And so today I chose to sit at the front of the church. The view is beautiful from up here, but it's also amazing down there when you're looking forward. So there's no scandal. I wasn't ousted from the chancel. I chose to sit there because not only in Black History Month do I have the right to sit where I want in any church, I have the right to sit where I want in any church when it's not Black History Month, amen? All right, so now the purpose for me being up here, God is good and all the time, amen. Church, we know that our God can do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we could ever purpose in our hearts and minds to imagine. We also know that God has blessed us beyond what we are deserving. So we invite you now in accordance with the scripture, to give as you are able, according to the blessings of the Lord our God, which has given unto thee. Amen. I got news, I got news, I got news, oh Lord, I got good news. I got good news, 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 I got good news. Thank <laughs> you. 
with the soulfulness this morning. Amen. Amen. For those of you who are able, would you please stand as we honor God? and pray with me. Gracious and holy loving God, Lord, we bow in great submission to the awesomeness of who you are, but more importantly, who you are to us as your children. Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to give. We ask that you would bless this offering, multiply it, allow it to be used for the further building of your kingdom on this side of glory, serving the people in this community as you would have this church to do. And Lord, we will be forever mindful that all blessings come from you and therefore are yours to return. It is in the strong name of Jesus, we all pray and let the church say, Amen. You may be seated. And a couple of announcements for today. Certainly, we thank our guests this morning for bringing God's word to us and wonderful message. Thank you so much. And the gift of song, we thank you for that. What a blessing it has been to all of us this day. We invite you to a reception afterwards, the meet and greet, which has been hosted by Crystal MacArthur and Geraldine Harvey. It'll be in our guild room. So we hope that you will join us back so you can speak with Dr. Bethel if you like and get a chance to meet him up close and personal and just spend some time at fellowship. So we thank you so much if you gather with us. We have Lent that is coming up. And so you should, if not received an email, there is a fire out and the announcements in the bulletin next week for our Lenten services coming up and a special program we have. This is in celebration of the 250th anniversary of the hymn Amazing Grace. And so we will be doing a special Wednesday study to look at God's word through the lens of that hymn and its history. Uh, we also have a lot of other things that are planned for that season. So we hope that you will join us for that season going forward. Next Sunday, we will be blessed to hear uh, God's word proclaimed by our own Darcella. So we hope that you will return to us again next week to hear those words. Are there any other announcements? Oh, and for the Super Bowl of Caring this day, I know it says in here that we are raising funds for the food pantry, but there is a need of a family, a particular family. And so the donations that you will give today are not going to go to the soup kitchen, as they said. They will go to a family that is in deep need. So we hope that you will continue, that you will contribute. The collection will be taken up after service. Are there any other announcements? Yes, I see a hand. Speaking of, we have Wendy coming for. Good morning, everyone. Super Bowl of Caring began in 1990 with a simple prayer. Lord, 
as we enjoy the Super Bowl football game. Help us be mindful of those who are without a bowl of soup to eat. Since then, Super Bowl of Caring has become a national Grace Ruth youth inspired movement with over 175 million that has been raised for general charities. So today, our Sunday School Department continues the tradition of having an annual Super Bowl of Caring campaign immediately after church service. We will be located in the Nartex and Chancel area with large pots of soup. Please be very generous in giving check of cash. Thank you very much. Are there any other announcements? Let us pray. Gracious and holy and amazing God, we come before you this morning as your people, seeking your presence, yearning for your spirit to take rebirth within our souls, to give us ears to hear your word, hearts that would embrace your love, hands that would rush to serve you in proclaiming and bringing about your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we are a people in need, in need of you. We are a world uh, that rocks and reels from injustice, from pain, from suffering, <clears throat> from all the things that you do not wish for your world. We pray for your spirit to move in us in powerful and amazing ways that we might witness and rejoice in your strength, your power, your grace, your mercy, and most of all, your love. Gracious and holy God, we lift up before you, our brothers and sisters that are seeking your healing presence, those that are mentioned here in our bulletin and those that are carried in our hearts. Be with doctors and nurses and all the caregivers that they might be wise and compassionate and caring in their care of those. We pray for the families and friends that surround them, that you might give them the energy and intelligence and imagination and words of love to help lift spirits. But may your spirit draw close to each of them and hear the prayers on our hearts, especially the ones that are so deep that they do go beyond words. We pray for all those who are homebound and especially for those that are released today from being homebound and have joined us in worship. We give prayers of thanksgiving for Maria's return, a miracle which is of your making. We pray for those families that are grieving the loss of loved ones and pray that your comfort may be found. Gracious and holy God, craft us into a people that is worthy of your name, that proclaims the good news of your gospel in all that we do that embraces one another across all lines and divisions, that we might be known as the people of God, loving, graceful, merciful, caring, powerful in your name. All these prayers and so many more we lift up before you in the words that your son, our savior taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rise and sing our closing hymn. Lift every voice and sing number 563. Amen.
May the blessing of God be with you, step with you each step, guide you through the paths of righteousness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we depart in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 